All right, so if you're just joining us or just are watching the recording, the lecture, your next lecture exam will be on Wednesday of next week, October 6. We're going to push that back. Um, we'll leave Monday to get through chapter nine, which will be special senses. But today we're going over chapter eight, which is your nervous system part two. Um, you guys will have a lab exam next week as well, and I will post an announcement about all of that. Um, but here's the nervous system. We'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the nervous system. Um, we divide it into your central and peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system, as we talked about on Monday, consists of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system consists of all the nerves and ganglia outside of the brain and spinal cord. And here we have, we'll kind of start with your spinal cord. It extends from the foramen magnum, where it leaves the brain cavity, um, to about the second lumbar vertebra. And you can see that down here. It's protected by the vertebral column. Remember, um, your vertebrae have little holes in them, and that's what the spinal cord travels down. Spinal nerves will allow for movement. So spinal nerves leave or exit out of the spinal cord. And if damaged, paralysis can occur. So, and then paralysis will occur depending on where, which level of the spinal cord is severed or damaged. Um, we have gray matter and white matter in the spinal cord. Uh, the gray matter is at the center. It looks like the letter H or a, a butterfly, and I'll show you a picture of that. And then the white matter is more outside or superficial. And just like we talked about gray and white matter on Monday, um, white matter is made of myelin, so it will contain the myelinated axon fibers. The white matter in the spinal cord um, located in the white matter of your central nervous system, whether it's in the brain or the spinal cord, um, we kind of divide the white matter into what we call columns. And we have a dorsal, ventral, and lateral column, depending on if it's on um, the front, back, or lateral side of the spinal cord. And these columns are basically tracks of action, the axons that will conduct action potentials toward the brain or away from the brain. So an ascending tract, um, so these columns contain ascending and descending tracts. Ascending tracts conduct action potentials toward the brain. So it's made of axons taking um, signals to the brain. And then descending tracts contain axons that conduct action potentials away from the brain. The gray matter in the spinal cord, again, it's the more, it's the deeper, it's shaped like a letter H uh, with horns. And we label those horns, um, whether it's a posterior, anterior, lateral horn. Um, and each horn contains different types of axons and neurons. And then the central canal goes right down the middle of the spinal cord, and it's always filled with fluid. Um, it's a fluid-filled center space in the spinal cord. So here's a look, finally, at a cross-section of your spinal cord. Um, we have more of a 3D view at the top. So you can see here that the gray matter is shaped in kind of this nice butterfly shape or H shape. And you can see that the different kind of pieces coming off are different horns. And the horns are labeled down here. So the posterior horn, um, the anterior horn and lateral horn. And then you can see coming off of the spinal cord, um, you see the roots of the spinal nerve. So um, ventral, remember, means anterior. So this is the front root. So if we're looking at the spinal cord, this is the ventral or front side. So I'm just going to write an F here for front. And then the posterior or back side is there. So the ventral root will attach to the front side of the spinal cord. And the dorsal root attaches to the back side of the spinal cord because dorsal means posterior. Um, kind of among, with the dorsal root, you have this little bulging, and that's called the dorsal root ganglia. And that's where you'll see a lot of the cell bodies of the neurons associated that are making up these spinal nerves. So the dorsal and ventral root come together to form spinal nerves. And these spinal nerves are then what exit off of the spinal cord. Spinal nerves go take nervous stimulation to all parts of the body. Um, and each there's a spinal nerve named for each level of the spinal cord for each vertebrae that comes out underneath. Um, we see our white matter here and how we've divided it into the columns, which are just descending or ascending tracks of axons, either going to the brain or from the brain. And they're labeled in the same way, the ventral column. Again, ventral, get that in your head. Ventral means front or anterior. Dorsal means posterior. So these are columns in the front and back. 
and then a lateral column of white matter. And then looking here, we see how different sensory neurons kind of enter and exit the spinal cord through these roots. And this is really important to kind of remember or study a little bit. So the spinal nerves themselves contain sensory and motor neurons. So sensory neurons are what will take in stimuli either from the external or internal environment. And then motor neurons or automatic autonomic neurons will then elicit some sort of response after the sensory information goes up to the brain and has been integrated. So how does the spinal cord in your brain receive information? All of the information that is picked up through different stimuli travels into the spinal um, cord via the sensory root or the dorsal root. And that we call that the sensory neuron. And it always travels in through the dorsal root, um, through the back or posterior side. And then from here, you can see these green arrows signifying that that stimulus or action potential is going into white matter, which means it might be heading up to the brain because that's where our tracks are. Kind of think of the white matter as the highway of stimuli. Or um, the sensory neurons can connect directly to what we call an interneuron. And this is common, especially in reflexes. Um, for reflexes to happen instantaneously, the sensory stimulation might not even go up to the brain. It might just connect with an interneuron or directly to some sort of motor neuron or autonomic neuron to elicit some sort of response. And that response then travels out of the ventral root. And we often call the ventral root the motor neuron um, because that's where the motor information travels out of the spinal cord. So then Again, the dorsal and ventral roots make up spinal nerves, but each spinal nerve contains sensory and motor information. The sensory information always comes through the dorsal root and the motor information then goes out the ventral root. Um, and this is really common in reflexes to have these interneurons because in a reflex, you know, think of the doctor tapping your patellar tendon with a rubber hammer, that reflex happens instantaneously. So your brain isn't even involved, isn't even involved in that. That reflex happens automatically. Um, so that would be something that could be tested. You know, if someone was in a coma, their knee jerk reflex should technically still work because it's not involving brain. Um, so we'll talk a little bit now about reflexes. Um, we, I think we briefly talked about it on Monday. So this reflex it's an involuntarily, involuntary reaction, so you can't control it, in response to a stimulus applied to the periphery and transmitted to the central nervous system, which could just be the spinal cord as well. The simplest reflex is what we call the stretch reflex, and this occurs when muscles contract in response to a stretching force applied to them. And the knee-jerk reflex is just a classic example of a stretch reflex. What the doctor does is he kind of hits your um, patellar tendon and that causes the tendon to stretch and stimulate muscle spindle fibers and that causes the knee to pop out. Other types of reflexes, and again, reflexes are very important for your body because they keep your body away from harmful stimuli, is the withdrawal reflex, um, also called the flexor reflex because of the part of the body will flex to withdraw or remove a limb or another body part from a painful stimulus. And this usually involves sensory receptors as pain receptors, and then the stimulation of these pain receptors, which will initiate the reflex. Yes, so a question in the chat, I heard when you touch something hot, your spinal cord makes you react. And that's because, so for example, that's, so if you touch a hot stove, um, that's like a withdrawal reflex. Or um, let's say you step on this tack, which does not look very pleasant. That's the stimulus. The tack kind of stimulates your pain receptors. That pain sensory information travels up the leg into the spinal cord through the sensory or dorsal root. And what happens is it usually the reflex occurs so quickly that your brain isn't involved right away. So the sensory information travels through an interneuron and then directly out through the motor neuron to cause this withdrawal reflex. And what that does is it basically flexes this hamstring muscle to take your leg off of that painful stimuli right away. So in a way, yes, only your spinal cord is working with these reflexes. 
it is showing an arrow going up to the brain. And what that signifies is that eventually your brain will know what happens. I mean, we can't really keep our brain. We can't keep secrets from our brain. But the initial act of taking your foot off a painful stimulus or removing your hand from a hot stove, um, the idea that your muscles are contracting and withdrawing your body part away, that's only using this interneuron. So it's just going into the spinal cord and out to be processed. Um, later, your brain will understand what happened within like maybe a millisecond later because everything happens so fast in the nervous system. But you're right. Good question. It only involves the spinal cord, these reflexes. All right. So spinal nerves, um, again, come off the spinal cord from the union or joining of those dorsal and ventral roots, which I kind of explained in that previous picture. Spinal nerves contain axons that are sensory, contain sensory information, as well as somatic motor neuron information. Spinal nerves are located between the vertebrae. So when you have a vertebra and a vertebra, a spinal cord will come out between them. And all your spinal nerves are categorized by the region of the vertebral column from which it emerges. So we have C for cervical spinal nerves, T for thoracic spinal nerves, and then lumbar spinal nerves. You have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Pair is because you have one coming out of each side. And we organize them into three plexuses. And a plexus is just a group of nerves that kind of come together in a very intricate way and then branch. So that's what a plexus is. So the cervical plexus is formed from spinal nerve C1 to 4, and it will innervate all of your muscles attached to the hyoid bone and the neck, not neck, uh, that's a typo. So these will be muscles associated with um, the neck, with swallowing hyoid bone. Um, it also, coming off of this cervical plexus, contains a really important nerve called the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve is an important one because it innervates the diaphragm. So we talked about polio and how polio had to do with paralysis of the diaphragm. So what polio was doing, it was probably um, basically paralyzing this phrenic nerve from innervating that diaphragm. The brachial plexus then originates from spinal nerve C5 to T1. So the first lumbar or thoracic spinal nerve. And the brachial plexus supplies nerves to the upper limb, the shoulder, and the hand. So again, these plexuses that come off of the spinal cord are kind of, um, kind of branches of nerves that will then go on to supply uh, parts of the body. And then the lumbosacral plexus originates way at the bottom from nerves lumbar one to sacrum four, and this will supply nerves to all the lower limbs. And this is a look at these plexuses. So again, here is the cervical plexus. So what will happen here is these first four cervical nerves come off separately, but then they'll come together to form kind of like a branching pattern that will supply or innervate parts of the hyoid bone and neck. Here's your brachial plexus and where those spinal nerves come off of. And then the lumbosacral plexus is more at the bottom. You do have a coccygeal plexus, which we don't talk about too much. Basically, the brachial plexus goes to the upper limb and the lumbosacral plexus goes to the lower limbs. Um, we also have spinal nerves coming off in the thoracic region, but they don't form plexuses, these groupings or conglomeration of nerves. Uh, the dermatones, so we'll talk about dermatones, and this is a very interesting concept. So the nerves are rising from each region of the spinal cord and the vertebral column supply specific regions of the body. And a dermatone is the area of, area of skin supplied with sensory innervation by a pair of spinal nerves. And each of the spinal nerves, except for C1, has a specific cutaneous sensory distribution. And this is incredibly interesting because doctors can test your spinal nerves and they can test each single spinal nerve, even by um, just brushing a brush over the surface of your skin, let's say in the forearm to see if you can feel that sensation of a brush. And that would mean that your C6 spinal nerve is able to receive sensory information. So that's what a dermatone is. And we divide the body into dermatones, which are again, areas um, that receive uh, sensory stimuli um, and the specific spinal nerve that will receive that. 
So now let's get into the brain and we'll start with the brain stem, which is the stem of the brain. So here we have the brain stem and what makes up the brain stem? Um, the brain stem is basically below the cerebrum. So kind of where my laser is, if I can't, well, here's your cerebrum. The cerebrum um, consists of all of the brain guts, I like to call them. So all the folds of brain tissue. Um, here's the cerebellum, which is a separate part. It's in, on the posterior inferior surface of the cerebrum. That's the cerebellum. It has to do with balance. We'll get to that. And then kind of the third part that makes up our brain is the brain stem. And it consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And then after the medulla oblongata, it will exit and travel down and change names to the spinal cord. So the brain stem is just the connection between the spinal cord and the brain. Um, we also have a part called the diencephalon that we'll talk about, which is kind of in the inner inside of the brain. So the medulla oblongata, this is the most inferior part. So the medulla oblongata will be continuous with the spinal cord. Um, it has a lot of functions. It helps to regulate heart rate, blood vessel diameter, breathing, swallowing, vomiting, hiccuping, coughing, sneezing, as well as helping with balance. And it has what we call pyramids in it, um, which are involved in conscious control of skeletal muscles. So that's the medulla oblongata. Um, the pons is above the medulla, and the pons is this little kind of rounded bump that sits right above the medulla. So that's the pons, and then the midbrain is right above the pons. So the pons is the bridge between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Um, and just to review, it's the bridge because here's the cerebellum and here's the cerebrum. They're two kind of separate parts. And the pons is the connection piece between the two. Um, and it helps to function in breathing, chewing, salivation, swallowing. Um, it's often what we call the relay station be between the cerebrum and cerebellum because it's the bridge or connection piece. And then the midbrain is above the pons. It helps to coordinate your eye movements, the pupil diameter, and turning your head toward noise. And um, the dorsal part of it, or the posterior side of the midbrain, has what we call four colliculi, which are involved in visual and auditory reflexes. They're kind of like little pea-sized shaped little balls. And those are colliculi that are involved in visual and auditory reflexes. I would encourage you guys as we go through the brain, this is all a lot of information, but I would focus, you know, just kind of take a moment to like realize how, I mean, just incredible that the medical community has come. The fact that we can figure out all these parts of the brain, um, it's pretty amazing. The world that we live in today versus years ago where they didn't know any of this too. All right, that's my nerd coming out of me. So the reticular formation. So here's some brain stem components and how everything is formatted in the brainstem. Um, reticular formation, these are scattered throughout the brainstem and reticular formation just refers to a formation um, of these structures that are involved in regulating cyclical motor function, respiration, walking, chewing, arousing, maintaining consciousness, and also regulating the sleep-wake cycle. And then we'll get to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is, again, the part of the brain that was separated. It's in the posterior, inferior, behind the, cere behind the cerebrum. It's attached to the brainstem by what we call cerebellar peduncles, which are kind of little like legs that connect the cerebellum to the brainstem. It literally means little brain. It's composed of its own gyri or folds of brain tissue, salt which are um, kind of depressions or like invaginations within the brain tissue and gray matter. And your cerebellum is very important for controlling balance, um, for coordinating your muscle tone and coordination of fine motor skills. So think of cerebellum, the big one with that one is the balance, coordination of fine motor, muscle tone. Then the diencephalon. So let's go back to our picture here because it's always helpful to see a picture. Um, the diencephalon, we're talking about kind of the inner part of the brain. It's located between the brain stem and the cerebrum. So here's our brain stem. Um, and then the diencephalon is right between that. And then the cerebrum, which makes up all these folds. The diencephalon consists of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. 
and I'll, we'll go over what those are important for. But here is, I'm just going to circle it a little bit better so you can see there's the thalamus. Here is the hypothalamus right in front of it. And then the epithalamus is kind of located on the back part of the thalamus. Is there a reason that someone has faster reflexes better than others? I mean, does it come from the brain? It could just be the way their spinal nerves are working because some, it, I mean, it depends. I mean, we, I should look into this a little bit more because sometimes it takes a while for a baby's reflexes to develop all the way until they're a year old. Um, so actually in development, embryological development, reflexes will change, especially in, in the first 12 months. And then after that, I think they kind of level out, you know, through kids, um, adolescents, young adults, adults more or less have the same reflexes. Um, but in the elderly, I would assume they would slow down a little bit. You can train your reflexes to react faster. How do you do that, Cameron? I did not know that. How do you train your reflexes? Just getting faster response time. That's interesting. I mean, I believe it. You can pretty much train your body to do anything, but I think some people having slower reflexes than others, it's just there the way they're nervous and nerves are made up. Good question though. Sports, yeah. So here's the thalamus. It's the largest part of the diencephalon. Uh, the thalamus influences moods, detects pain. The epithalamus is located above the thalamus. It helps um, with the emotional and visceral response to odors. And then the hypothalamus is located below the thalamus. And the big thing about your hypothalamus is that it controls the pituitary gland. And it's connected to it by a little stalk called the infundibulum. And the hypothalamus is incredibly important because it will kind of regulate the hormones that come out of their pituitary gland that control homeostasis, body temperature, thirst, hunger, sexual emotions, fear, rage. So that's why uh, the hypothalamus is very important. Very interesting. What's an F1 driver? Is that like a, a race car driver? So I'm not familiar. That's very interesting though, I believe it. Okay, very interesting. So here's the different parts of the diencephalon that we just talked about. The thalamus is this part. Um, it, this little like bullseye structure is called the interthalamic adhesion. And that's because the thalamus is made up of like two halves and they're like stuck together with what we call this interthalamic adhesion, which holds the two halves of the thalamus together. Here's the hypothalamus, which is again, very important for controlling uh, the pituitary gland, which is shown here. And the pituitary gland is what releases a lot of our hormones and the release of those hormones in the pituitary gland is controlled by the hypothalamus. And then here's the epithalamus kind of behind it. Um, which it includes what we call the pineal gland, which is important in your sleep-wake cycles. Um, your thalamus has what we call different regions of it called nuclei, and each kind of region of the thalamus has a different um, function as well. All right, cerebrum characteristics. So then this is the largest portion of the brain. I call it the brain guts. These are the folds of brain tissue. Um, you have a right and a left hemisphere of the brain. So if you kind of separate the brain right down the middle, and we were to take it apart, we'd see a right and a left side. And they're separated, these hemispheres, by the longitudinal fissure. And I think we'll show a different picture that shows the separation. But we divide the cerebrum into lobes. And these lobes are named for what skeletal bone they lie underneath. So really easy. The frontal lobe is in the front, below the frontal bone. The parietal lobe will be underneath your parietal bones. The occipital lobe is underneath the occipital bone. And then the temporal lobe around your ears is underneath your temporal bone. Um, we see um, another kind of anatomical term called the sulcus. And the sulcus is kind of a deep kind of division between brain folds. And there's a very definite division or line or kind of separation between kind of the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And we call that kind of division or kind of like it's a valley between the, the lobes or a valley between these ridges. We call that the central sulcus. And then if it's a smaller kind of division or a smaller valley between these folds, we call those fissures. So there's a lateral fissure 
fissure that separates out your temporal lobe from frontal and parietal. So those are some cerebrum characteristics. Um, the cerebral cortex is the surface of the cerebrum. So whenever you see the word cortex in anatomy, it usually means just the superficial surface. So the cerebral cortex is just the surface of the cerebrum and it's composed of gray matter. And that makes sense because your brains look more grayish in color. This one looks a little whiter, but what you're looking at, the cerebral cortex is what covers all the surfaces of the cerebrum and it's made of gray matter. The cerebral cortex, so the most kind of superficial gray matter layer of the cerebrum controls our thinking, communicating, remembering, understanding, and initiates all the involuntary movements. Here are some cerebrum surface features that I talked about. Gyri are the folds of the cerebral cortex. Sulci are shallow indentations. And fissures are more deep indentations um, between the gyri. So um, a single gyri is called a gyrus. A single sulci is called a sulcus. Um, and then the sulci and fissures are just indentations between those gyri. You have a left and a right hemisphere that controls the opposite parts of the body. Your left hemisphere is responsible for more the math, analytical, and speech. And the right hemisphere is more responsible for the music, art, and abstract ideas. So when you say that somebody is more right-brained than left-brained, that actually has some truth to it. Usually left-brained people are a little more math, analytical, scientific. Right-brained are probably the really talented ones with the music, art, abstract ideas. Um, and then the corpus callosum is the connection between the two hemispheres. Um, and they each control different sides of the body. Um, I knew someone who was a, went to music school. She was just this incredible music teacher. And she was often taught that if you are able to play an instrument or a sport, um, that make, means you're very intelligent because you're able to use kind of both hands at once to do two separate things, like if you're playing the piano or a musical instrument, because you're using both sides of your brain to control opposite sides of the body at the same time. I don't know. I'll let you guys decide that. But for in general, I think people who can play an instrument, that's a pretty cool talent. The lobes of the brain then also have um, kind of specific functions. So the frontal lobe is in the front. And this is what will control your voluntary motor actions, your aggression, moods, your smell. The parietal lobe, again, is on the top underneath the parietal bone. And the parietal lobe helps to evaluate all your sensory input, like touch, pain, pressure, temperature, and taste. The occipital lobe is, lobe is in the back. And the big thing or the big function of the occipital lobe is vision. And then the temporal lobe um, is easy to remember its function because it'll be by your ears. So it'll help with hearing, smell, and memory. And again, knowing the lobes of the brain and their functions, you'd probably be tested on that with a matching type question. That's probably a good matching question. So here's a superior view of the cerebrum showing the different hemispheres, right and left, um, the occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, the central sulcus, which is again an invagination or depression between the gyri and the longitudinal fissure is a very deep um, indentation. And another picture of that. All right, sensory functions. And I'm gonna kind of pick up the pace here. I've kind of gone a, a little slow and we have a lot to get through. Sensory functions, so your essentially central nervous system constantly receives all sensory input. We usually are unaware of most of the sensory input and sensory input is very vital of our survival and normal functions because our brain takes in either what the body um, senses from the external or internal environment and then make adjustments. Ascending pathways or ascending tracks are the sensory tracks carrying impulses up the spinal cord to a specific area of the brain and each tract is involved with a limited type of sensory input like pain, temperature, touch position or pressure, and the tracks are usually given composite names that indicate their origin and insertion. And these ascending tracks usually begin with the prefix spino, indicating that begin, they begin in the spinal cord, such as one track is called the spinothalamic tract. It begins in the spinal cord and ends in the thalamus. Sensory tracks typically, typically will cross over from one side of the body in the spinal cord or brainstem to the other side of the body. And the left side of the brain always receives sensory input from the right side of the body and vice versa. So not only 
do your right and left brains control opposite sides of the body, but they actually receive information from opposite sides of the body. And this is a look at some of these different ascending spinal cord tracts in the white matter and the names that are given to them. Here's the dorsal column ascending track. You can see um, how the sensory information will travel up. And then you can see where this crossing over occurs to kind of from the left side to the right side of the body. And it, this crossing over occurs in the medulla oblongata and a really fancy name to describe crossing over of these tracks is called decussation. And I don't know if we'll, you'll hear that word again, but if you ever see that in future classes, decussation just means crossing over of these spinal cord tracks. Um, sensory areas, so the part of the cerebral cortex that will receive the sensory information will either be in the primary sensory area or the primary somatic sensory cortex area. The primary sensory area will be where the ascending tracks project, where sensations are perceived. And the primary somatic sensory cortex is the general sensory area and the parietal lobe. And this is where all sensory input will be received as pain, pressure, and temperature. Then the somatic motor functions, remember somatic means skeletal or think of SS. So somatic motor neurons will innervate your skeletal muscles. And these, this is what your somatic motor system is responsible for. Um, basically all of your skeletal muscles. So the ones that maintain your body's posture, balance, moving your trunk, limbs, everything, and also communicating through facial expressions as well as speech. Reflexes that are mediated through the spinal cord or are traveling through the spinal cord and brainstem are responsible for some body movements that are involuntary. Um, so most of your, you know, most of your skeletal muscles are controlled through voluntary movement. So you are consciously activating a skeletal muscle to achieve a specific goal, like walking, typing, sitting up straight, doing a yoga pose, um, writing with a pencil. Those are all voluntary movements. Um, if it's an involuntary movement, that's usually what the reflex is, which we talked about. Voluntary movements will result from stimulation of neural circuits that consist of two motor neurons, um, an upper and a lower motor neuron. Upper motor neurons have cell bodies in the cerebral cortex and project down the spinal cord. And then lower motor neurons will synapse with them. They will have their cell bodies in the anterior horn of the spinal cord gray matter or in cranial nerve nuclei. And the axons of these lower motor neurons leave the central nervous system and will extend through the spinal or cranial nerves to skeletal muscles. So we're gonna be getting into a lot of information here that no one really ever likes about the spinal cord because it get, you're, we're talking about things that are hard to picture, but just try to always remember the big picture. We're talking about your somatic motor system, which is innervating skeletal muscles and these are the two neurons that are involved in that, an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Motor areas of the cerebral cortex. So these will be areas of the brain, the cerebral cortex, so the surface of the cerebrum um, that controls specific parts of the motor area. So the primary motor cortex is located in the frontal lobe that controls voluntary motor movement. So that's in your frontal lobe of the brain. That's really what where the control is coming from with a lot of your voluntary um, control of your skeletal muscles. The premotor area is also in the frontal lobe, but this is where motor functions are organized before then they're initiated or sent out. And the prefrontal area is the, where motivation and the foresight is to plan and initiate this movement. I just, I can't believe how we've learned all of this. Um, that's why science is so cool. And you guys should just continue to take more science classes um, because the brain is just incredible and how much we know about the brain is even more crazy. This is also why, you know, if someone has a tumor on a part of the brain or a part on the pineal gland, the tumor can sometimes make people really upset, really moody. Um, and that's often been the case. You know, I think Sometimes people can be misdiagnosed tumors. And then once they take a CAT scan or an MRI, they find the tumor, depending on where the tumor is in a specific part of the brain, that will determine what part is really being affected for that person. So the, here are all sensory and motor areas of the cerebral cortex. So these are all the areas of the cerebral cortex. So remember, the cerebral cortex is just the surface of the cerebrum. So these are showing shaded areas, but just on the surface of the cerebrum.
And we know which surface of the cerebrum is associated with these each areas and what each area is important for. I don't know if you'll need to know every single one. Maybe there's one question here. Um, I'm getting a couple questions. I think you're right. Yes, Matt, I would agree with you. And I got a DM from somebody. Yes, I will. I'll ask me at the end of class about that. Okay, so we're, I think we're going to go over some of these areas and what they each do. Basically, what you're looking here is the front part of the brain is all the motor information. And the back part of the brain, we have a lot of the sensory information. So what that means is a lot of your sensory information will go to the parietal lobe first. And then the motor responses that are initiated come out of the frontal lobe. We also have areas for speech, auditory, um, auditory association. We have taste areas, visual association and visual, visual cortex areas. Remember those are in the occipital lobe, sensory speech areas. Um, all right, so descending tracks. Descending tracks are then motor tracks because they're traveling down from the brain carrying impulses that have been kind of figured out um, to elicit some sort of response. Um, corticospinal tracts are considered what we call direct because they extend directly from upper motor neurons to lower motor neurons. Some tracts are considered indirect because they originate in the brainstem, but they're indirectly controlled by the cerebral cortex and other nuclei in the brain and the cerebellum. We have the tracts in the lateral columns of the white spinal cord matter. They are most important in controlling goal-oriented or directed limb movements like reaching and manipulating. Tracks in the ventral columns, such as the reticulospinal tract, are most important for maintaining posture, balance, and limb position through the control of neck, trunk, and proximal limb muscles. Um, these descending tracks also cross over, um, meaning that the left side of the brain controls skeletal muscles on the right side of the body and vice versa. So just keep that in mind, all sensory information, all motor information that your brain gets, um, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. So here are the descending tracks in purple and showing where they're located again in the white matter. So here is a direct motor um, tract, meaning it's directly connected. It crosses over here in what we call a pyramid of the medulla oblongata. Um, and here, I guess it doesn't show an indirect tract, but there's a direct motor tract. Uh, basal nuclei, I think we saw that in a previous slide. This just refers to groups of functionally related nuclei. So a nuclei is a nucleus of a cell, most likely a nerve cell. And these are just a bunch of nuclei that are grouped together because they have a similar function and they will help to plan, organize and coordinate motor movements and posture. Um, we have kind of groups of basal nuclei called the corpus striatum and the substantia nigra. And again, these are just groups of nuclei, cell nuclei that have similar functions. So here are where some of these nuclei are located in the midbrain and the corpus striatum, um, kind of on either side of the thalamus. All right, speech is mainly um, controlled in the left hemisphere. There's a sensory speech and motor speech area called Wernicke's and Broca's. Um, how are nuclei different from plexus? Good, so the nuclei is just a, a single nucleus um, from a, a nerve cell and a plexus is a group of nerves that kind of come together. And I'm just gonna do, I'm just going to, I know we have a lot to get through, but I'm just going to show you a quick picture of the brachial plexus because um, I know I just want to show you. So here we have the brachial plexus, and I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen one more time. So you guys can take a break or get some water. I'm kind of going back here. So here we have the brachial plexus. So a plexus, and maybe a better way to see it is looking at this picture. You have groups of spinal nerves that come off the spinal cord and kind of join what we call a plexus, which is kind of like a group of nerves that come together, they branch together and then kind of separate out again. And um, we have the cervical, brachial and lumbosacral plexus. So a plexus is just a group of nerves. Okay, back to basal nuclei. Hopefully you guys can all see this now. All right. Okay. Hopefully that answered your question. Where does subconscious thought drive from? Subconscious thought. Um, 
I would have to go back and look into that. And maybe we'll get to it, Yolanda. If I don't, I'll answer that question at the end too. Okay. So here we have speech, the two parts of the areas of the brain associated with speech where words are heard and comprehended. Comprehended happens in the parietal lobe or the Wernicke's area. And then where words are formulated happens in the frontal lobe or the Broca's area. So again, if people have a stroke, a tumor in their brain and it's affecting one of these areas, their speech might be affected as well. Brain waves and consciousness. Um, so the brain waves are used to diagnose and determine treatment for a brain disorder. And we can look at someone's brain waves by taking an electroencephalogram, which is an EEG. And this is where we place electrodes um, on the scalp to record someone's uh, electrical activity of their brain. And we have different brain waves, alpha waves, beta, beta waves, delta, and theta waves. We'll see alpha waves when the person is awake but quiet. Um, beta waves is when someone is in intense mental activity. So right now, I don't know if you're in alpha or more beta. Hopefully you're pretty relaxed right now when you're in alpha. Um, you'll see a lot more delta waves when someone is in a deep sleep and we'll see theta waves in children. So that's interesting. Our brain waves will change a little bit depending on our age. So here's hooking someone up with the electrodes placed on their scalp um, and this is what we call an electroencephalogram. So measuring someone's brain electrical activity and the different types of waves that you can see and what they look like. So they all kind of have a characteristic form and frequency. Memory. Um, encoding memory is the brief retention of sensory, or encoding is the word to describe brief retention of sensory input um, by the brain while something is scanned, evaluated, and acted up. And this is also called sensory memory. It's in your temporal lobe and it lasts less than a second. So we're gonna go through different types of memory. So this is a sensory memory. It's a brief retention of a sensory input, um, but it lasts less than a second. Consolidated memory takes data that has been encoded. This occurs in the temporal lobe. Um, consolidated is our short-term memory. So it takes the data or what we're remembering, but it's more of the short-term memory. Storage memory is long-term memory. And we can remember things for a few minutes long-term, or we can remember things permanently um, long-term storage. It depends on the retrieval and how often um, you retrieve that information from your brain or think about it. So that's storage memory. The idea of retrieval is how often the information is used. So you can really solidify something in your long-term memory if you're thinking about it. So if you think about your earliest memory, maybe it was from when you were three, four, maybe less than that. You know, if you constantly think of that memory, retrieve it, maybe look at a picture about it, that would kind of solidify it as long-term memory in your brain. Short-term memory is usually information that's retained for a few seconds or minutes. So this is short-term memory. I mean, I think of my dad, bless his heart, he's 73. You tell him something, two seconds later, you have to tell him the same thing. I don't know if it's because he's older, he just doesn't want to pay attention. But that's what short-term memory is. Usually it's information less than seven, so um, just bits of information. And then long-term memory, it can last for a few minutes or permanently Episodic or episodic memory um, refers to remembering a place or an event. And then learning memory um, is util utilizing past memories um, to kind of keep something into your long-term memory. So a lot of this is kind of, I don't know, a little philosophical. We're talking about memory here. Um, but again, it has to do with different parts of the brain and how your brain can kind of keep up with different information. Also something that slows down with age. Um, but, you know, if you think about what usually slows down with age is people's short term memory, there's 90 year olds who have the best long term memory I and mean, they can remember things from years ago. Um, but again, the short term memory is usually what um, can kind of decline uh, faster in age. Okay, limbic system, I'm going to kind of keep going here. I'm just looking at my time and emotions. So uh, your limbic system influences long-term declarative memory, emotion, visceral responses to emotions, your motivation and move, mood. Um, you have olfactory cortex and certain deep cortical regions and nuclei of the cerebrum and diencephalon. That group are grouped together to form this um, limbic system. 
Um, the major source of sensory input to the limbic system are your olfactory nerves. So smell is very important in this kind of emotional um, system and kind of maintaining a mood. So smell is incre incredibly important in your limbic system. It's also connected to and associated with the hypothalamus. So remember your hypothalamus controls a lot of your hormones. So if we have a lesion or some sort of damage to the limbic system, it can often result in a voracious appetite, increased or perverse sexual activity and docility, docility um, which is kind of, you just kind of feel like not doing anything that's being docile. And that would include a loss of normal fear and anger responses. So limbic system, very interesting there. And this is where the limbic system is and kind of what all makes it up. Knowing all of these exact anatomy is probably not super important, um, but this is your limbic system and emotions. Uh, meninges are the three connective tissue layers that surround the brain and spinal cord. So meninges are connective tissue that surround the brain and spinal cord. The outermost, most superficial meningeal layers called the dura mater. Does audio and scent affect similar things with memory? Um, yeah, though I, and I don't know, I'm not like a brain surgeon and I don't know all of this, but I do know that your scent is, or the sense of smell is incredibly important in pulling up memories as well. It's one of the most um, strongest ways to pull up a memory is a sense of smell. And maybe you guys can remember that from your childhood, a certain smell, maybe of your grandfather, your grandma, um, or a smell of, you know, for me, it was sagebrush. I grew up in Eastern Oregon. So I just, the sense of smell of sage, like it just takes me back to my childhood. So I just know that sense and the scent of smell can have to do with memories audio. Similarly as well, um, I mean, you guys could maybe research and let me know more of that, but all good questions. So the dura mater is the outermost toughest layer. It has two layers. Um, the second meningeal membrane is very thin and wispy called the arachnoid matter. So if we're looking here, we have dura matter, arachnoid matter, and then there's a subdural space between the dura and arachnoid matter. It contains, um, it's a potential space containing a small amount of serous fluid, cerebral spinal fluid is, and blood vessels are found in this subarachnoid space below the arachnoid layer. And then the third meningeal layer is the pia matter. So let's show a picture of this here. So underneath your skull bones, you have these three layers of connective tissue to protect the brain. The dura matter is the outermost toughest layer. We have a subdural space before we get to the arachnoid matter. So here we have dura matter, arachnoid matter. Underneath the arachnoid matter, we have a subarachnoid space with vessels in it. And then we have the pia matter, which is the very thin, delicate layer of connective tissue that kind of travels over all of the um, folds of your gyri or gyruses in the brain. These three, same three layers, dura, arachnoid, and pia matter, um, can be found traveling the length of the spinal cord as well. And you can see them labeled here, the dura matter, the subdural space, arachnoid matter, and the pia matter as well. So you can see how these meningi layers, layers of connective tissue, just serve as another protection piece of your brain and spinal cord before they're surrounded by fat, vertebrae, or your skull bones. The ventricles um, in the central nervous system, um, so these are fluid-filled cavities called ventricles. So these are spaces in your brain that are filled with fluid. Each cerebral hemisphere contains a large cavity called the lateral ventricle. So you have two lateral ventricles. And then we call the third ventricle third because we've had already had two lateral ventricles for each of the hemispheres. The third ventricle is smaller in the middle cavity located in the center of the diencephalon between the two halves of the thalamus. And then the fourth ventricle is located at the base of the cerebellum and connected to the third by a narrow canal called the cerebral aqueduct. And this fourth ventricle is what will be continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. And this is where cerebral spinal fluid will flow. So here are the brain ventricles. The lateral ventricles are in each hemisphere. Here's the third ventricle. Um, and then the fourth ventricle is right in front of the cerebellum and it's connected to the third by the cerebral aqueduct. And then the fourth ventricle continues on down the spinal cord um, as the central canal. And again, these are filled with cerebral spinal fluid which helps to bathe the brain, providing a protective cushion around the central nervous system. 
Um, it's lined with ependymal cells located in the choroid plexus. Um, the choroid plexus in bold here, sometimes this is a good text question. The choroid plexus is what will produce the cerebral spinal fluid. And then the ependymal cells lining these ventricles have cilia on them and they help to kind of move that cerebral spinal fluid around. Um, CSF uh, fills the brain ventricles, the central canal, the spinal cord, and the subarachnoid space. Um, it flows from the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle down to the fourth, um, down into the central canal. Um, a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid actually goes into the roof and enters the subarachnoid space between those dura layers. Masses of arachnoid tissue are called arachnoid granulations, and these will penetrate the cerebral sagittal sinus, um, which is a venous sinus or space and the longitudinal fissure. And this is where cerebral spinal fluid will pass from your subarachnoid space into the blood through these granulations. What are the functions of the brain ventricles? So the brain ventricles control or contain cerebral spinal fluid and cerebral spinal fluid helps to kind of provide, give some buoyancy to the brain. So think about your brain is kind of floating in the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid also surrounds the brain in that little subarachnoid space layer. So it provides kind of a protective cushioning to it. And it, it allows the brain to kind of feel like it's floating um, for a little more protection or light weight. So here's the flow of cerebral spinal fluid starting at the choroid plexus where it's formed, traveling into the lateral, third ventricle, fourth ventricle, down the um, central canal and then up through the subarachnoid space. So that's the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. All right, I think we're gonna end with the cranial nerves then. So these are cranial nerves, sorry about that. They're named by Roman numerals and there's two categories of functions, sensory and motor. And these are the different cranial nerves. Um, why would the cerebral spinal fluid flow into the blood? Um, mm, I don't know if it's necessarily flowing into the blood. It's flowing into these spaces in the brain. Um, eventually it might be like kind of circulate with the blood as it kind of gets recycled. But for the most part, it's um, kind of associated in these, um, these areas or ventricles that don't have blood in them. So these ventricles only contain cerebral spinal fluid. Um, I don't want to say that eventually they might mix with blood because there's blood vessels everywhere um, that will eventually probably help to recycle and reuse some of the cerebral spinal fluid too. I can look into that. Good question, Yolanda. Okay, so here are the cranial nerves. Um, again, they're with labeled numbers. Chemistry balance, yes. A lot of times you'll find a lot of your um, white blood cells in cerebral spinal fluid. It could leak from the ear and nose to indicate cervical damage. Yes, yes, yeah, good points, I am Matt. Good points. I really appreciate how you guys are actively listening to these lectures in an online environment. It's probably not easy to do so, so I appreciate your questions. So your olfactory nerve is the, or your cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve. It's a pure sensory nerve for smell. The optic nerve is a pure sensory nerve for vision. It attaches to the back of the eyeball. The oculomotor nerve is a pure motor nerve to help with eye movement. The trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number four, is a pure motor nerve for eye movement as well, so helping move some of those muscles of the eye. Um, cranial nerve number five is called a trigeminal nerve because it has three branches to it. It's both motor and sensory, sensory for pain, touch, and temperature for the eye and lower and upper jaws, and it's motor for some of the muscles of chewing. So it'll innervate your um, masseter muscle, the muscles for mastication. The abducens nerve is a pure motor nerve for eye movement. It will help to abduct the eyes, so move them laterally. The facial nerve is both sensory and motor for taste, sensory for taste and motor for facial expression. The vestibulocochlear nerve, um, what goes to your ear where the cochlea is, and it's a pure sensory nerve for hearing and equilibrium. Glossopharyngeal nerve is both motor and sensory, sensory for taste and motor for swallowing. And then the cranial nerve number 10 
is the only, only, only cranial nerve that goes into the thoracic and abdominal cavities. It's both motor and sensory for the organs in those cavities. And then 11 and 12 accessory nerve goes to the trapezius, sternal clido clidomastoid and muscles of the larynx. And the hypoglossal is a pure motor nerve that goes to the tongue. It's easy to see glossal, that suffix means tongue. So here are all the cranial nerves and how they come off of parts of the brain as well as parts of the brain stem. And you can see those located here. Yes, some of these nerves could get damaged during a stroke, especially the mainly the one you think of a stroke usually affects the facial nerve that, because that's the one that controls some of the muscles of facial expression. And usually it only affects one side of the body. So you might see someone with a stroke, um, the muscles of their face are just completely relaxed. The autonomic nervous system, and I promise we're almost done here. You guys are holding up really well. This is a heavy chapter. Um, the autonomic neurons innervate all things that happen automatically in the body. So smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, your glands, these all are controlled unconsciously. And we separate or divide your autonomic nervous system into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division. Increased activity in the sympathetic neurons generally prepares the individual for physical activity. We often call the sympathetic nervous system the fight or flight response, so getting the body ready for emergencies, physical activity, whereas the parasympathetic stimulation generally activates involuntary, involuntary actions like digestion that are normally associated with the body at rest. So we call the parasympathetic division often the rest and digest division. In your autonomic nervous system, um, two neurons are always present. They extend from your central nervous system to the effector. The first neuron is the preganglionic neuron, and the second is the postganglionic neuron. And these neurons are named that way because preganglionic neurons synapse or connect with postganglionic neurons in autonomic ganglia, which are clusters of cell bodies within the peripheral nervous system. The sympathetic division cell bodies will originate in the lateral horn of the spinal cord uh, between segments T1 and L2. And these axons of the preganglionic neurons exit through ventral roots and project to either sympathetic chain ganglia or collateral ganglia. And I think, I hope to show you a picture of that. Parasympathetic division, these preganglionic pre cell bodies are located in the lateral part of central gray matter of the spinal cord that give re, um, kind of rise to nerves S2 to S4 and other preganglionic cell bodies are located within the brain stem. So we often call the parasympathetic division the craniosacral division because it's the, the cells arise by the cranium and the sacrum and the sympathetic division is the thoracolumbar because it's preganglionic neuron cell bodies originate more in the thoracic and lumbar segments of the spinal cord. Um, these axons of the parasympathetic division will extend through spinal nerves or cranial nerves to terminal ganglia located near an effector organ, um, such as in the head or in the walls of organs in the thora thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. And most of the thoracic and abdominal organs are supplied by these preganglionic neurons of the vagus nerve extending from the brainstem. So here is somatic and autonomic nervous system. You can see somatic um, nervous system goes to skeletal muscles. That's voluntarily controlled. Autonomic nervous system goes to smooth muscles, things that are subconsciously controlled, like um, some of your digestive organs. And this is finally the last slide of the PowerPoint. This shows the innervation of these organs by the autonomic nervous system. What it's showing in um, blue is the sympathetic division. So these cell bodies will go through the sympathetic chain where these ganglia are. And on the right side, we see innervation by the parasympathetic division. So these neuron cells will originate in the cranial, they're the brainstem region and the sacral region. And you can see how and where they each innervate different parts of the body. So I will stop my recording.